Dr. Judy Barsalu is a renowned scholar of political science and Middle Eastern affairs, and she's currently the president of the Hel Hibri Charitable Foundation. Thank you very much to the organizers. I have learned so much from all the presentations this morning, and um, they have surfaced debates and disagreements. Um, they've, in some cases, uh, particularly the two panelists who just preceded me have tried to define terms, which I hope, I hope will help uh, enhance understanding of my own paper and the presentation I'm about to make. Now, because I'm afraid of our moderator and I do not want to exceed our time, um, I will say that I am mindful of the fact that I uh, am on a panel called Memory and Reconciliation, but I have major problems with the term reconciliation, and I'm happy to address that question why I have a problem with the term uh, in the question and answer period, I prefer the term social reconstruction. Um, earlier this morning, uh, with some of the presentations, we were sort of flying at 30,000 feet, which I applaud. I love getting in airplanes and looking at the landscape below and doing um, the kind of research that involves surveying um, dozens of cases or, or more um, long stretches of time, I think is incredibly a, a great step forward in this field. What I'm going to do with my presentation is take you back to the runway uh, at ground level and um, try to, to talk about some, um, some issues that uh, I think arise in this field of transitional justice as seen through what I described as the blurry lens of the so-called Egyptian revolution. And I had the honor of and pleasure of and sometimes terror of living in Egypt over a five-year period between 2008 and 2012 um, and saw for the first time up, up close and personal, as they say, what it looks like to live in a society in great upheaval and what the discourse is around uh, transitional justice and the understanding of transitional justice, or I would say lack of understanding. Um, so my remarks will uh, look through the lens of Egypt in the hope of illuminating larger questions. Um, I'm going to be trying to address three basic uh, questions. Um, what is the connection between collective memory, memorialization, and transitional justice? Um, as transitional justice has spread internationally, how is it understood locally in a country undergoing upheaval and maybe transition? And third, how has the digital revolution transformed efforts to shape collective memory and to seek justice? Um, so now on the first uh, question. Um, uh, the term collective memory is in fact a relatively recent one, but arguably efforts to shape how we understand the past is an intrinsic part of human civilization. And here's proof of that. Um, here's a, a wall frieze from Upper Egypt that it dates back to 1460 BC. In, and this is a common sight in uh, all over Egypt where you see um, the chiseling out of a figure, a god or a ruler, uh, by someone who succeeded him or her uh, in an effort to uh, reshape the telling of the history of that period. Um, fast forward to 2011, and here's a wall uh, frieze painted uh, on a wall adjacent to Tahrir Square in downtown Cairo, which it, it engages in a similar process. Uh, and, and, and asks people to forget what has passed and focus on the election. In this case, this was a referendum about the, con uh, the constitution writing process. Um, the first known mention of the term collective memory is in 1902 by an Austrian poet and essayist. Um, but uh, really, uh, the distinction between history and uh, collective memory was articulated in a landmark study in 1925 by a French sociologist who made a distinction between history as the reaching for an objective, truthful account of events based on professional scholarship versus collective memory, which is a much more selectively constructed uh, set of perceptions about the past formed through interactions among individuals, social groups, and the surrounding environment. Um, today, we understand uh, transitional justice are closely linked, but that wasn't always the case. Um, we are now in the midst of what one scholar described as a memory boom. And I can say that when I was a graduate student in the 1970s as in political science, the w memory was not an object of study for political scientists. Um, today, political scientists are looking at memory as an independent variable affecting political outcomes. And of course, because memory is so slippery, it's a very you know, challenging subject. Um, but uh, today, we understand transitional justice is basically standing on five pillars, five sets of activities, criminal accountability, uh, truth-telling, 
uh, institutional reforms, including security sector reform and judicial reform, material and symbolic reparations for victims, and finally, on public memory pro projects, including memorialization, uh, rewriting history texts, uh, uh, innovating tech, uh, pedagogy in, in classrooms, and so forth. I would say, however, that uh, it, it's important to make the point that if you go back to the founding original documents around the emergence of the field of transitional justice, particularly um, the records from a, a conference that was convened in 1988 that brought together some of the key practitioners and, and social scientists focusing on what, how you transact justice in times of transition, uh, from which the field of transitional justice has largely emerged, that um, there was no mention of memorialization as a component of justice and uh, accountability. And, and arguably today, uh, even still, when you go to international conferences in a place like Cairo um, or uh, elsewhere, um, often it's not even on the agenda, and yet um, it's all around you outside in the streets of Egypt. Um, so uh, it's a stepchild, but I think I and my fellow panelists would argue that it's the elephant in the room and we need to grapple with how it is that collective memory is formed and whether it's being used to promote social reconstruction or to perpetuate violence. Now, turning to the second question that I identified, um, as transitional justice has spread internationally, how is it understood locally? And I uh, decided in the middle of this uprising that I didn't feel, feel that I knew how Egyptians conceived of justice and accountability in post mubarak Egypt. What were their values and expectations around justice and accountability processes? So I conducted a two-part study about nine months after the removal of Mubarak that took place over the course of five months. And clearly, a lot has changed since then, and it was a you know, very dynamic period politically. Uh, uh, and, and so the findings from this study um, have to be understood that you know, it is a snapshot of a particular period of time. But it was based both on a survey administered to about 170 people in Cairo in three surrounding governorates and uh, in-depth interviews with 50 people in, in Cairo um, where I tried to tease out some of the things that I was seeing from the survey results. I have to say, it, I don't have time to go into my findings and in my paper there is, uh, I'd be happy to send you a copy of the paper if you're interested in seeing the fuller uh, findings. Some of the findings are represented also in my paper. But I would say that I found um, in Egyptians an am amazing thirst for justice and accountability and strong support for due process and the rule of law, although, although the latter was moderated in part by class status with working class Egyptians being less focused on due process than better educated um, uh, people. Um, I also found um, uh, a desire to learn more about transitional justice as it had unfolded in other parts of the world, but really a lack of, a profound lack of knowledge about transitional justice. I was careful not to use the tr term transitional justice in my study because I found that both professional human rights activists and political scientists literally didn't know what transitional justice meant. That, of course, by now has changed because there's a lot more conversation in the country about transitional justice. Um, but I, the, the other thing that became clear to me was that many th would talk about transitional justice as though it was a, a buffet. Uh, as others have said this morning, a buffet that you can choose from. You can pick the tomatoes and the, uh, and the cucumbers, but you don't have to you know, eat the spinach. Um, and uh, uh, I found this uh, uh, problematic. And for, for one thing, I, I found in my study uh, something that really surprised me, which was that Egyptians um, didn't put a high priority on truth telling. Um, and when I, uh, and this came out in my survey, uh, in a rank order of 11 possible interventions, uh, typically, you know, the, the toolkit of transitional justice. I asked people to rank order uh, their choices, and truth telling only came number seven out of 11. Um, the, the primary focus was on security sector reform and other uh, institutional reforms. Quite naturally, I, can, I think I can explain why that is. Um, but what I asked, uh, but, but truth telling is absolutely at the heart of transitional justice as we understand it. And when I asked Egyptians why that was, they either said, I think I know what the truth is, or this place is so messed up, I have trouble believing that you could ever institute a process where the truth would truly be revealed. I don't have confidence that this could happen and therefore it's a lower priority for me. 
I think that might have changed now. And again, this is you know a dynamic, moving situation in a snapshot, um, but but interesting nonetheless. Um, the other thing that really emerged um, was that for many there was almost, I would say, a confusion between social justice and transitional justice. Now, we know from the slogans that we saw in Tahrir Square, um, you know, bread, freedom, dignity, that for many Egyptians, uh, you know, about 40% of the population lives on $2 a day or less, uh, the, the uprising, or the revolution as Egyptians like to call it, uh, was all about improving the quality of life. Not just necessarily, in, you know, of course people wanted to have their voices heard, of course they would prefer democracy if it were available, but it was really about better access to clean water, decent schools, adequate health care, decent housing, et cetera, and, 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 and employment opportunities, opportunities in particular. Um, this, uh, this finding really caused me to revisit the intellectual beginnings of transitional justice as a field. Um, which is a, a field that, of course, grew out of experiences in Latin America where there were a series of fragile democracies emerging out of, di of military dictatorships. And those who were at, at the heart of defining the field were really talking about a negotiated process um, using intervention, traditional justice interventions that would facilitate the exit of former dictators and secure and bolster the strength of fragile emerging democracies. To my surprise, uh, among some Egyptians, uh, I remember, you know, like it was yesterday, uh, an afternoon I spent in an Egyptian think tank talking to young Egyptians who defined themselves as Nasserites, although they were all born after Abdel Nasser died. Uh, they, uh, we had this, I would say, discussion uh, about what transitional justice is. One, one of them said to me, Abdel Nasser, who, remember, was the member of a military coup that overthrew the, the, the monarchy in 1952, Abdel Nasser instituted transitional justice. Why? Because he inaugurated land reform. And this was transitional justice because it was social justice. And I said, wait a minute, you know, transitional justice um, is at the heart about ushering in and securing and strengthening a transition to democracy. Now, we, this, is a, this is a debate that we can continue to have, but I do think it's important to be very clear about the terms and to understand that when we go into a place like Egypt, we talk about transitional justice, what may be heard by those listening to us or with whom we're speaking, they may not interpret it in the same way. I would argue uh, uh, that this confusion was compounded um, by the arrival of some of the top experts in transitional justice um, coming to conferences in, in Cairo to which uh, people from various Arab, so-called Arab Spring countries were invited, um, and, and sharing their wisdom, uh, their profound uh, knowledge about the implementation of transitional justice in other settings, both in the North and South. And, uh, 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 not uh, really engaging in a discussion about the, the, the context in Egypt or Yemen or Tunisia or whatever it happened to be, uh, either because they were unprepared to do so or because they were really focusing on telling, you know, how do you set up a lustration system? What did it look like in a particular place? Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be having those conferences. I'm saying that um, it can be very confusing when you talk about transitional justice when you have a minister of transitional justice who's been appointed in your country, but your country is really not making a transition to democracy yet. Um, and so there really is a, a potential for the undermining of the field and the reputation of transitional justice um, when we're not very clear about what the goals of transitional justice are. Now let me um, turn to uh, my third question, which is how the digital revolution has transformed efforts to shape collective memory and seek justice um, and promote uh, social reconstruction. Um, I've argued in another paper that um, in the past three years, uh, Egyptians have engaged in uh, what I've identified as four different processes through which ordinary people, not the builders of monuments, you know, paid for by the state, but ordinary people have uh, created, um, stored, 
uh, manipulated and conveyed their memories, their personal memories of what they have lived through to literally millions of people around the world as well as their members of their own society. These four um, types of, uh, of, of activities include the building of digital platforms for the collection, storage, and sharing of materials, uh, through demonstrations, marches, and memorial services, all of which you know, are episodic in nature, but which, uh, the memory of which is captured through photos and videos, which again are stored on these digital platforms, through efforts uh, to rename, sit, rename and reuse civic uh, spaces and recapture formerly closed civic spaces for public use, and finally, through literally an explosion of artistic activism, um, where artists were the most revolutionary of the activists in the sense that they were um, using their talent, whether through songs, through videos, through uh, paintings, um, through uh, literature, to uh, promote uh, their interpretation of the revolution and its, its agenda. I'm going to quickly show you some, um, uh, some slides that give, give you a sense of what these look like. Here is a slide that was a, memory, a, a, a website that was created where people were invited to upload their um, memories of, uh, of particular victims. Um, this is one of my favorite where uh, activists wanted to show the distance between the actions of the, the military and uh, their words. And they, people were, again, invited to upload their photos and their videos to this website. And of course, not everybody in, the, in Egypt has access to the internet, so the activists were then taking the material that was uploaded here, setting up um, projectors and screens in the streets of poor neighborhoods all over Egypt, and showing these videos and these photos to counteract the effect of, of, the, of the words by, you know, that were being uttered and, and, and quoted in the press by the military authorities. Um, here's uh, a, a picture of an impromptu memorial that was built literally hours after the fall of Mubarak in Tahrir Square. Within uh, a day or so, it was swept away, again, by military th authorities, but it lives on in the memories of people through this photograph, which is online. Um, here's an example of a memorial uh, demonstration, um, in this case, where the uh, participants were carrying symbolic coffins etched with the names and the pictures um, and the circumstances of the death of particular victims. Um, here's uh, a, a Facebook platform to build a campaign to rename the Mubarak Metro Station, which is under Ramsey Square, a central square in downtown Cairo, to Khalid Saeed. Uh, uh, metro station. Khalid Saeed was a young man who was beaten to death by the Alexandrian police about eight months before the uprising began and who became an icon of the revolution. Um, here's an example of a collective of filmmakers who created an organization called Mosarin, uh, which means insisting in Arabic, to crowdsource, uh, to, to make a film about the 18-day uprising by, through crowdsourcing, inviting people to upload their videos and photos, and then they created a single film about the uprising. Finally, here's just one of, uh, you know, I would say thousands of amazing pictures, uh, wall friezes that uh, you could find literally all over Egypt, but especially in Cairo and Alexandria and the main cities. Uh, mo literally memorial, uh, attempts at memorialization. These are the, the features of actual people and names and the circumstances under which they were killed. Um, other signs of struggle over memory include um, two efforts uh, over the last three years to rewrite a national history texts, um, which is an inter another interesting story. I don't have time to go into the details. Um, an ongoing struggle over control of the National Archives, um, where one historian had, was invited to create an archive on the revolution, but then na the continuation of national security controls over access uh, uh, caused ma major problems. And what I would argue is um, ongoing struggles over the right to information, which is an incredibly important issue that we tend not to talk about within transitional justice, but access to information is often not available in, in societies in which uh, there's conflict, and it's one of the key things that needs to be instituted uh, as a sort of institutional reform uh, before you can really create the openness uh, that, that is part of democracy and transparency. Um, just some final remarks um, that uh, uh, memorialization 
like everything else, every other tool of political, of transitional justice is, is a political tool. And it cuts, it's a double-edged sword. It can, as my colleagues have said on the panel earlier, it cuts both ways. It can perpetuate conflict, it can build re social reconstruction, uh, but it's, po it's a political uh, tool. Um, second, that it's so common to try to shape uh, collective memory through eradication of past accounts uh, rather than uh, preservation of past accounts as sort of uh, object lessons of, of the past, uh, teachable moments. Uh, I remember I was in a conference once with someone from Mozambique who said, we don't have the money to rewrite our textbooks. And another teacher from Latin America said, that's okay because you, as long as the pedagogy changes, that textbook becomes an, an opportunity for teaching about the version of history that was honored before. Uh, and uh, uh, it needs to be addressed through a different interpretation. Third, that digital technologies have, if you will, radically democratized the formation, the ability to try to influence and shape the formation of collective memory. And finally, as a result, um, for those who are trying to manage transitional justice processes, the challenges are now ever greater because everybody has a cell phone. Even if you don't have access to the internet, you have a cell phone, you can take pictures, videos, etc. cetera. And um, managing what are often very um, uh, undermining uh, memories, uh, if you're trying to rebuild society uh, in positive ways, it used to be easier before the digital re revolution. So thank you very much.